Okay, so we got so many different directions we can take this. Okay, one one thing that you just said uh, in your last uh, answer is you said that that uh, Americans are fiber starved. In your book, you said that ninety seven percent of people living in the United States are fiber starved. Couple questions: Number one, what the heck does that mean? Number two, how do you know that they're fiber starved? Number three, how much fiber should people be eating? How many questions can you rattle off at once and try to confuse me? This is amazing. I can go. I can go a lot more. (laughs) There's a level of intensity here, but I I like that. I like that. All right. So the, the, the issue is, hold on. I don't even remember the first question. So so how do you know that 97% of people are fiber star? All right. There's this thing that we keep seeing showing up. Um, which is that we try to do studies on fiber in the United States. And a common way to do a study is you line up a group of people. Let's pretend it's 100 people. And what you're going to do is you're going to take the high fiber consumers and compare them to the low fiber consumers. So what you would do is you would say, oh, of these 100 people, I'm going to compare the top 20 in fiber consumption to the bottom 20. Well, guess what? When you do that study in the United States, the high fiber consumers are consistently below the daily recommended amount of fiber, which is 25 grams for women and 38 grams for men. We can't even do a study in the United States with people eating the recommended amount of fiber because even the high fiber consumers are less than the recommended amount. Oh, and the reason the people in the high fiber group are less than the recommended daily amount of fiber. The high fiber consumers are getting less than 25 grams. When you look at these studies, when you pull them up, you're like, oh my gosh, the high fiber consumers are 22 grams on average, the low fiber consumers are eight. And the recommended amount is 25 for women and 38 for men. It's absurd. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's really kind of sad and depressing. So the statistic that 97% of Americans are not getting the minimal daily amount of fiber is completely accurate. And it has consequences when it comes to your gut health. There is a special connection between fiber and your gut microbes. This is their food. They are as alive as you and I are. What happens if we starve? If we starve, we grow weak. We start to recede. Our muscles go away, which is a big deal for a guy like Cyrus, who's a professional bodybuilder. And we end up in a place where we're not capable of performing our daily activities. Like we literally become incapable of doing the normal things that you need to do on a day-by-day basis. Guess what? That's literally the exact same thing that happens to these microbes. If you don't feed the microbes, they grow weak, they recede, and at some point they become incapable of helping and supporting your body in the way that we rely on them for. And there's a study that was done by Justin Sonnenberg, who is a microbiome researcher at Stanford. And by the way, Sonnenberg um, has supported my book and you'll find him inside the cover. So he wrote a book called The Good Gut, which was a great book as well. Fantastic. And what, what Sonnenberg showed in the study is that if you take mice and you put a human microbiome into the mouse and you, and you monitor what happens over generations. Now, of course, like I'm not advocating for animal research here. And this is a study that is impossible to do in humans because it takes 30 years to have a new generation. It would take us 90 years to do this study in humans. But in mice, they put a human microbiome into the mouse and they monitor what happens from grandma to mom to daughter. And what they found is that there is a generational loss of diversity, basically meaning the gut is getting weaker generation by generation on a low fiber diet. Now there was a way to reverse that. You could fix the problem. And that was quite simply to reintroduce fiber. But if you waited too long, you could get to the point where you reintroduce the fiber and it's like, dang man, we missed the boat. It's too late, we can't get the microbes back. So the bottom line is that here we are and for at least one generation, our generation was raised on a low fiber diet, right? We're children of the 80s. So, and the generation before us was the first to move into this low fiber diet. And here we are and we see the emergence of all these issues that are associated with damage to the gut, not just digestive issues, which are insanely prevalent. I mean, I literally wrote in a study myself, 70 million Americans with digestive issues. But beyond that, 
immune issues, you know, autoimmunity, allergic type problems, diabetes, metabolic disorders, you know, obesity, auto, uh, hormonal problems, mood disorders, all of these things come back to gut health. And the bottom line is that our low fiber diet is what's doing it. All right, Dr. B. So while I was reading your book, um, I saw that you were claiming there are multiple types of fiber. So most people think, oh, it's just soluble and just insoluble, but you claim it's not that simple. What do scientists know about different types of fiber? Fiber is incredibly complicated. So to estimate or measure how many different types of fiber exist in nature, like literally scientists have not come up with a number, but we think that there's millions, if not billions of unique types of fiber, okay? Fiber is not just fiber. Every single type has its own unique biochemistry. It will have different effects. And so the fiber that you find in a beam is different than the fiber that you will find in kale. And that's different than the fiber that you will find in a steak, which there's none in the steak. There is no, there is no fiber outside of the plant world. And one thing that you also said was that uh, there are something like 300,000 different varieties of edible, I'm sorry, of plants and about 100,000 of those are edible, is that right? Believe it or not, so you actually had it, you had it right, 300,000 edible plants. There it is, okay. On the planet, out of 400,000 plants total. We could literally be going outside right now and we could probably be eating a lot of the plants that are around us. And, but you know, it's interesting because unique plants, different plants, have different types of fiber and our gut microbes, I want people to, like, this is just as important as the Starbucks coffee comment from before. I want people to realize that these microbes are picky eaters. They are picky eaters. And so what that means is that they want the fiber from specific plants. The microbes that feast on the black bean may say, oh, I don't like kale. I'm not eating that. Okay, so because these, these microbes are picky eaters, because they want the fiber from unique types of plants, the critical idea to optimize your gut health is to have as many different varieties of plants as possible. Different varieties of plants produce different types of fiber, which supports a diverse gut microbiome. And guys, this is like, look, okay, cool. It's a great idea. It's a great idea. It's a, it's a phenomenal theory, Dr. B. I'm not in the business of writing a book about a theory. There's enough of those. There's books about the lectin theory. There's books about the gluten theories. There's enough of those. I'm in the business of writing a book about real science. And I wouldn't come forward with this idea if I didn't have the backing of the legitimate science. The American Gut Project, which is the largest study to date, to make a connection between our diet and lifestyle and the diversity of our gut microbiome found that the single greatest predictor of a healthy gut microbiome is the diversity of plants in your diet. Okay, so that was my next question is, why is diversity important? Go into a little bit of detail here about what does it mean to have a diverse ecosystem of bacteria in your large intestine? And in addition to bacteria, what other organic material exists? So I like that you call it organic material. You're such a scientist. I don't know what to call it. I just thought that on the spot. <laughs> um, all right. It's, what's fascinating to think about is that if you had a combination of a microscope and a telescope, you could see our, not just world, but the entire galaxy on all these levels and realize that there are all these different ecosystems. All right. The gut is an ecosystem, like inside of you. And that is conceptually similar to a rainforest, right? Which is conceptually similar to the globe on a larger scale. And the rules of each ecosystem are the same, which is a fascinating thing to consider. Biodiversity is the word. If you look at the Amazon rainforest, zoom in there for a moment, there is this community, this, this balance that exists between snakes, the birds, the bugs, the animals, you know, 
the trees, the plants, the river, it all is there in harmony. It's the way that nature created it. And if you go into that ecosystem and look, I don't like snakes. I don't like mosquitoes, but they serve a necessary purpose within that ecosystem. And if you go in there and you take them out and they go extinct, there will be a void that exists within that ecosystem that the other animals are not designed to compensate for. Those snakes and mosquitoes are there for a reason. And so loss of diversity within any ecosystem is dangerous and it can lead to basically the ecosystem becoming fragile and incapable of doing the job that it's there to do. The same is true in your gut microbiome. If you go into the microbiome and you start removing species, those species are there with a purpose. Each one of them has a role in human health, contributing to digestion, our immune system, our hormonal balance, our metabolism, our mood and brain. Each one is there with a purpose. We need to support every single one of these microbes and allow them to thrive. When we have a diverse ecosystem within our gut, we have a resilient, strong ecosystem, a resilient, strong gut that is capable of taking on whatever you toss its way. And by the way, that includes things like COVID-19. We've never been exposed to a virus like this before. This is the first time. And when you have a balanced, strong, resilient gut, it is more built and adaptable to whatever you throw at it, including a new virus like COVID-19.